All right, today I'm going to talk about four things that you probably didn't know about the Ogden hyperelastic model. So the first one is that there are different kinds of the Ogden model. If you look carefully at these uh, screenshots that I took from the, these different finite element manuals, you can see that Abacus is the one that's different. It has a square on the alpha term here, which the other ones don't have. What that means is that you actually always should have a positive mu value if you use the abacus implementation of the Ogden model. But the other ones, you should have cases where you have a negative mu value. So that changes a lot of things, obviously. So don't try to convert parameters between different finite element codes when it comes to the Ogden model. They are different. And that will be important for the calibration. Second difference and point here is that um, this material model has two kinds of material parameters. We have the mu and alpha, and then we have the d. So d is volumetric, mu and alpha has to do with the rest of the response, the deviatoric response. Um, if we just specify n to be equal to 3, we'll see that these are the terms that contribute to the energy in volumetric deformations. Um, the point here is that in most cases when you use the Ogden model, you don't typically have information about how the bulk modulus changes with volumetric strain. So what you need to do is to typically just ignore the last terms here. So I typically find D1 based on the information about what the bulk modulus is or based on the Poisson's ratio. And I set the rest of the D parameters to be zero because I don't have enough information about it and I don't really care about it anyway. Third point is the alpha parameters. Most of the action in the Ogden model comes from the alpha parameters. That controls all the cool features that you can predict using this model. So let's take a look. Here is stress strain data for three different cases. The red curve, I used mu equal to one, alpha equal to one. So this is unaxial compression, unaxial tension. It's almost a straight line if mu alpha is equal to one. If I increase alpha, let's take, for example, the blue curve. Now I increased alpha to be two, so it's a larger exponent on the lambdas here. And then I actually reduced mu a little bit in order for the stress strain curve to go through the same point over here. So I scaled alpha mu, I scaled mu a little bit to get to that point. And we'll see that the, the stress strain curve becomes more nonlinear in this case. And it's even more clear when we go to alpha equal to four, we see that the larger alpha is, we get a more stiffening effect in tension, but we get a softer response in compression. And that's how alpha influences that response. Now, what if we change things a little bit and we make mu a negative number and we make alpha also a negative number? So negative, negative, this is still a well-defined energy function. What happens now is as we go from alpha equal to minus one to minus two to minus four. We'll see that a larger negative alpha term causes a stiffening effect in compression, but not so much of a difference in tension. So alpha positive has to do with tension, alpha negative has to do with compression and how the material responds. So one can come up with a rule of thumb based on this. I typically try to use three Ogden terms. One, I have alpha sort of close to one or around that. And then I have one where alpha is uh, way more than one and one that alpha is way negative. And then I scale the mu parameters properly. And by doing that, I can have a material model that has the right stiffening effect in tension and in compression. And you can only do that if you have some of the terms also have alpha to be negative. Number four. Um, it's the calibration. This material model is a little tricky to calibrate. So to demonstrate that, I will use experimental data from Trelor. Here's my Trelor book uh, that has this data in it. It's uh, uniaxial tension, uh, biaxial tension, and pure shear. So what I will do, I will first calibrate my three-term uh, Ogden model to the, just the tension data. And that's the, what's shown here. The red solid curve is the prediction, and it looks pretty good. The error is small. It, the, corresponds well to the experimental data. But then if I take that material model and see what does that model do when, it, when I compare the predictions to the known results for biaxial and shear, we see that the model doesn't work very well at all. The errors are very large under those conditions. 
So what this means is that you can't calibrate the Ogden model to use tension data, uniaxial tension data, and then expect it to work in anything that's different than uniaxial tension. It doesn't work. How about this? How about if I use both uniaxial tension and the pure shear data? And that's the red and the blue here. I can calibrate them all, and it works very well under those conditions. But what if I then take that calibrated material model and compare it to the biaxial predictions that I have, the data I already have from Trellor, and see that it doesn't still work. I need more information. In other words, in this case, two loading modes was not enough either. So I actually had to activate all three. And if I do that, I can pretty accurately predict uh, the data set that's available uh, in this case. So keep that in mind. Don't use too little experimental data and think you can get a good Ogden model. You can't. You really have to be very careful working with this type of nonlinear material model. To summarize, Abacus is different than the other finite element solvers in how it implements the Ogden model. Typically, I only have one D parameter to be non-zero. That's D1, and the other one I set to be zero, simply because that's all the data that I have. Make sure that you have some alpha values to be negative. Uh, that gives you this a better symmetry between tension and compression, which is how most uh, rubber-like materials behave. And finally, uh, make sure you have enough experimental data if you use this type of hyperelastic model. If not, you will run into a lot of trouble. Um, uh, if you have any questions about the Ogden models or any comments about this, you can ask them below.